All right, thank you everyone for joining us today for our presentation on what's new in Cisco Unified Communication Manager 9.0. My name is Jamie and I'll be your host. Just to give you a little information about us, Sunset Learning has been a top tier Cisco Learning Solutions partner since 1996. We offer a full list of training courses for routing and switching, data center, security, and wireless, but we really specialize in our unified communication courses and contact center training. We have over 35 locations across North America, and all of our class dates are guaranteed to run. You can find more information about us, and you can see our full guaranteed to run training schedule on our website at www.sunsetlearning.com. Now I'd like to introduce our presenter for today, Marn Mahoney. Marn has been a Unified Communications Specialized Instructor at Sunset Learning for over five years now, and we're so lucky to have her as a part of our team. Marn has been in the information technology industry for over 20 years, and she's worked at several reseller partners and also at Cisco as a network consulting engineer. With that being said, Marn, I'll let you take it from here. Um, so thank you, Jamie. Um, and uh, to our UC9, what's new in UC9 uh, presentation. So of the generalized hour, um, LDAP and manual user support. Short answer, prior versions of Call Manager required you to either be LDAP integrated or not. Starting with Call Manager 9, you can do both at the same time. I'll show you how to do that. Native call queuing, the ability for a hunt pilot to queue calls rather than having final forwarding behavior have to go someplace specific. Again, I'll show you how to do that. It's awesome. Deterministic codec selection, being able to order in the specific order that you want the codec selection for Cisco IP phones. This is similar to a voice class codec list in a router, um, but now you get to do it in call manager, which is pretty cool. Enhanced locations-based call admission control. This is one of the ones that made me very, very excited about call manager nine. Um, and, uh, enhanced locations-based CAC does some really amazing things for especially larger organizations, organizations that have um, uh, many locations, organizations that have several um, clusters. It, it, it's really cool. CUCN URI registration and dialing. The ability for call manager to accept a SIP based style um, incoming call request. So a request to mmahoney at sunsetlearning.com can be parsed by call manager and then sent directly to my extension, which is, again, very cool, brand new. Extend and connect the ability for call manager to assist third-party phones in using call manager features. And it, that may sound like, yeah, big deal. It actually is, and we'll get there. And then some smaller items, which I think is just kind of interesting. Um, new user pages. Cisco finally, after what almost 15 years, has redesigned their end user web interface and made it much easier for your end users to actually use. Um, and finally, pause and speed dial, which again, small item, but the ability to inject a pause into a speed dial for pager dialing or dialing um, using forced authorization codes or client matter codes. Just some neat stuff. Um, so here we go. Um, uh, as Jamie mentioned, at the end of each section, I'm going to be asking for questions. So if you do have some, type them into chat, and uh, Jamie will ask them as I uh, uh, finish each section. So here we go. So LDAP and manual user support. Prior to Call Manager 9, you either had to be LDAP integrated or not. Once you are LDAP integrated, the ability for you to create local user accounts was disabled. Um, and you know the problem with that is if you had like a conference room phone or whatever that you wanted to have listed in your corporate directory, you couldn't do that without giving that conference room phone a AD account, which, you know, there's licensing issues and oh my goodness, what a pain. And for organizations that have contractors who have phones but do not have AD accounts, the ability again for them, you know, to, to be um, seen in the corporate directory or whatever, it, it was just a real problem. So. Um, now we get to do that. So let me show you how that's done. First of all, as far as LDAP integration itself is concerned, that hasn't changed. You still go through the same LDAP integration um, uh, method that you did before. But now, and I am LDAP integrated, I can go to my end user list, 
and I have all of these LDAP integrated accounts and all that, but check it out. I also have a local user account, um, a conference room phone just you know, as my example. And if I open up that account, um, you can see that it says again here active local user and I have my add new buttons which again sort of implies I can create local user accounts. Whereas I still have all these other guys that are LDAP integrated. Now the nice part is that conference room phone can now be found on um, Cisco IP phone. So let me access the corporate directory here and I'm going to do a search. And if you look, you'll see that I have a conference room phone. Oh, where'd it go? Did I pass it by? Mm, oh, there it is. There it is. So there you go. Um, now, it, it, it's one of those things that's very easy to demonstrate because, you know, it's sort of binary. You either can do it or you can't do it. But the fact that you can is very, very exciting. Um, just as a reminder, so LDAP integration works just the same, but now you also get to get end user accounts. Now that said, like with other LDAP integrated accounts, if I create a local account in Call Manager and on the next LDAP pass, uh, Call Manager detects an incoming account that has the same username, that account will get, um, that will get um, uh, synchronized. And so do be careful of that if you're creating local accounts, make sure they don't match user IDs that are in your LDAP system. Um, and last, uh, lastly, something I did not mention before, if I go into a local, or an LDAP synchronized, synchronized account, I can also convert that to a local account as well. An LDAP synchronized account that gets converted to local will not get resynchronized on the next LDAP path. So that is um, LDAP synchronization with local account support as well. Very cool. Um, and so, Jamie, uh, any questions about LDAP? Yeah, we had a couple come in. Um, the first is, is LDAP still only one AD source, and can you sync from multiple AD clusters? Um, not AD clusters. So the way LDAP integration works is, first of all, of course, you can only sync to one type of um, LDAP server. So I'm still having to pick you know, Active Directory or open LDAP or whatever. So only one kind. Number two, the AD servers that you synchronize with need to be in the same Active Directory forest. So if I have you know, parent domains and child domains, that's all fine and dandy. Um, although, again, with LDAP, you still have to be um, having, uh, you still have to have at least one synchronization agreement per domain, because wherever you point your LDAP uh, directory, your, your synchronization agreement, you get everything from there down to the edge of the domain, but not a child domain. So if you have you know, sunsetlearning.com and then you have a subdomain of um, you know, europe.sunsetlearning.com or something like that, that would, you'd have to have two synchronization agreements. But if you, that, that would be one tree in your Active Directory forest. If you have a second tree in your Active Directory forest, you can still sync um, and you can still have um, uh, you know, synchronization agreements in that other tree. If you have more than one forest that requires separate uh, uh, call manager um, systems, it, you, you, you can't cross outside. And, and that's partly for authentication. With authentication, you're going to be going to a global catalog server, which sort of implies that you're all part of the same forest. So hopefully that answers the question. I, it, Jamie, let me know if there's a follow-up. Okay. Um, any other questions? Yeah, there was two more that came in. Okay, with the new LDAP feature, is there any way to update the IP phone field in AD via the CUCM? Oh, wouldn't that be nice? No, it is still a read by call manager of AD information. It's a one-way um, synchronization. Uh, any changes made in um, uh, call manager itself do not get passed along. Oop, wrong spot. In fact, if I go into my end user accounts, you'll see that still my AD uh, sync accounts, the information like telephone number is non-editable. That is because it has to be populated in call manager and then synchronized to, I'm sorry, um, has to be entered into AD and then synchronized to call manager. So sorry, no, wish there were, hopefully future versions. Perfect. And what was the other one, Jamie? All right, the last one for this section is, can you pull information via SNMP to populate the LDAP? No, nope, no, nope, sorry. This is this is straight up LDAP sync. Um, call manager is going to use an LDAP 
account to query the LDAP database. So SNMP does not come into play. Again, would, would be nice, would be nice. Perfect. Did it? Yep, that's it, thanks. Okie dokie. All right, so um, next section then. So our next item, oh, uh, okay. Um, native call queuing. So in previous versions of call manager, you could have a hunt pilot, which went to a, you know, um, a, a hunt list, line group, and then individual DMs. If there were no, um, if there were no agents available, if there were no uh, line group members available for that call, then the final forwarding behavior kicked in and it rolled to voicemail or to an operator or whatever. Starting with call manager nine, call manager itself natively can queue calls. So if I have, you know, five people in my uh, line group and on all five of them are on the phone or all, you know, three of them are on the phone, the other two are not available or whatever. Call manager itself, as long as there is at least one line member potentially available, will um, uh, cue the call. They will get hold music, they'll get an introductory announcement, um, you know, thank you for calling, your call's important to us, that sort of thing, and then uh, re-announcements um, uh, re every X number of seconds, 30 by default. Those uh, welcome announcements and the you know, periodic re-announcements are all totally customizable. You can have different ones for different, um, you know, different announcements for different queues. Um, it, it just works really, really well. A single call manager uh, line group member can be in more than one line group. That line group can be part of more than one hunt list. So you can be a part of multiple queues. And how call manager handles queued calls is that it will take the longest queued call and send it to the next available agent. It really is the answer in the order it was received. If a, uh, a line group member is in more than one line group or that line group's in more than one queue, so, you know, potentially hunted to for several things, then um, what call manager will do is figure out in any queue who has been holding the longest that can be sent to that uh, line group member and it will forward that call. So that's actually pretty smart. Um, in addition, um, line group members, I don't have this set up on, on uh, our demo, although I probably should for future versions, but the line group member themselves, they can uh, push one of their line appearance buttons, it's a, it takes real estate on the phone, but they can see what queues they're part of, how many users or how many callers are in each queue, and how long people have been um, uh, in queue waiting for someone to answer. So you can sort of monitor it right from the phone, which is just awesome. I just think it's really, really cool. All right, so um, let, let's take a look. To set it up, it's really, really easy. I'm gonna go into Call Manager, and first of all, I do have a Hunt Pilot here. And the Pilot is 2222. Now, the final forwarding behavior that is standard in Call Manager 85, 86, and earlier um, is still there. And I can see that right here. I've got my you know, forward hunt no answer and forward hunt busy behaviors. I still have my maximum hunt timer. So you know, if you are upgrading into nine, those, um, those fields uh, uh, port over to the new system. Um, and if you just prefer the old style, this is the way you do it. But if you would like to do queuing of calls, continue to scroll down and I have a little checkbox here yes please queue calls now notice that as soon as I do that this stuff out here becomes unselectable you get sort of either or you can either do final forwarding behavior traditional or you can queue calls so queuing calls is this simple it is so simple um, which music on hold audio source will be used to queue these calls now I only have the sample audio source loaded but you can, you know, upload your own music on hold music. So there you go. Then, maximum number of callers allowed in queue. How many calls do you want to queue? Um, this uses um, essentially CTI ports in the background. You don't actually have to create any CTI ports, um, but just from an overall capacity on your call manager, if you have lots and lots of queues, you want to maybe, you know, minimize the number of people in queue, but yeah, that's just a design issue. Now, here you go. When the queue is full, the default is to um, disconnect the call. 
But what I can do instead is say, well, gee, then maybe I want to send it to an operator in a particular partition. But that's only if the queue is full. Also, if the maximum wait time, so here is your uh, maximum hunt timer. When a call is queued, how long can somebody sit in queue? That 900 seconds, which is the default, is 15 minutes, which I think is really, really long. Um, but again, totally configurable by you. If I do you know, hit the maximum wait timer again, what do I want to do? Drop the call as a default. Instead, maybe again, I'm going to send it to an operator. When no hunt members are logged in or registered. So I have my five members of my line group. All of them are not available. Their phones are unregistered. They are not logged into hunting. Um, then what do you want to do? So again, I'm going to say, you know, send it to this destination. But we are going to queue a call. So here, here you go. That, that's really all there is to it. I'm going to go ahead and click Save here. Now, the last thing we need to look at, for my uh, audio source for Music on Hold, as I mentioned, you can set up custom um, announcements. Let's go to that Music on Hold audio source, and it's number one here. Here is where I set up the announcement settings. An initial announcement. Um, the uh, welcome greeting. This is just a sample one that Cisco has put in, but um, you can upload files right here, right? Upload file, and that allows you to upload your own announcements. Initial announcement plate. Anytime somebody is on hold or only if they are being queued. Which periodic reannouncement do you want them to hear? I'm going to again just do sort of wait and queue sample. That's the sample one that Cisco puts up. How frequently do you want to have that periodic reannouncement set? And then a locale announcement. Now, the locale announcement is important for the following reason. If you have more than one language enabled on your call manager cluster, these initial announcements, periodic announcements, are um, part of the language pack that you install. You know, just like the, all the enunciator announcements and whatnot. So if I am an English-speaking person using the English-speaking GUI, but I'm setting up a queue for, let's say, a German-speaking hunt, I can specify that for this German-speaking hunt that they have the German language. Now, I only have the English in here, but, but that's how that works. And again, that's all the harder it is. Very, very simple. Let me go ahead and save this too. And let's try a call. Now, I have two users here. I have uh, Joe Doe and I have uh, Jane White. And what I'm going to do, cancel, exit. Um, they are both currently logged into hunting. Um, I do have a busy trigger of two for both of them. So what I'm going to do is set up two calls between them. And then uh, call in using a third phone and hear the, hear the call. So here we go. Let me call Joe here at 2001 and enter, and then I'm going to mute immediately. All right. Now, let me create a new call. I'll put this on hold, create a new call, and call Joe again. Oh, that's, I'm actually getting the hold announcement for all hold, hold calls, which I think is sort of interesting. And again, here we go. Okay, so here's my third phone. Um, I'm going to go ahead and dial the hunt pilot. I'm going to hit call. Okay, there you go. Now I should hear a whole music. Just this lovely default hold music. <laughs> but that's that. And that was really, really easy to set up, which I just think is uh, fabulous. Oops. And call, hold, resume, and call. There we go. So that, that, that's all there is to it. Very, very simple. Um, native call queuing, poor man's contact center, but you know, for an operator queue or a help desk queue, just really, really, really helpful. Um, that's what I have for that. So, Jane, were there any questions about hunting? Yes, we did have a few come in. Um, first, does this replace uh, Contact Center? 
Oh, absolutely not. No, no, no. This is very, very simple. There's no, I mean, I'm not talking about line group members. I'm not talking about agents. There's no integration with databasing. Any, any of the standard stuff that you get with, you know, contact center apps, this is not that. This is just queuing, simple queuing for simple calls. So, no, sorry. Yeah, because that's a whole other server. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, hopefully that answers the question. Uh, anything else? Yes. Um, does the queuing feature interfere with agent software from Contact Center Express or Enterprise? No, no. If I am a member of Contact Center and I have Contact Center agent software set up on my desktop, and it just so happens that for some odd reason my administrator has also put me into a standard hunt line group, then um, if a call is hunted to my phone, then I will, um, if I answer it, then I'm seen as busy as far as the contact center software is concerned. Um, keeping in mind, of course, that with standard hunting with call manager, your busy trigger, if it's two, if I'm on a call, and this would include if I'm on a call with the agent software and contact center, if my busy trigger is two, I will still get hunted to by the hunt because if there's a line available, it will hunt to me. So I, you know, really the upshot in the end for that one is you don't want to do both. You want to have somebody as a member of you know, contact center or hunted to with call manager native thing, but you don't want to do both. That's, it's, you're gonna, you can, but it's definitely I, would, I wouldn't do it if I were administering the system. So hopefully again awesome. answers the question. Um, yeah, we have uh, a any other questions? Yep, yep, yep. Oh. Um, does this have any reporting capabilities? Oh, absolutely. All this stuff generates call detail records. Um, and if you have, uh, like even in your trace files, if you have set up, you know, please trace route list and hunt list, it will show you the hunting path. I check this, check this, check this queued the call, you will see the uh, media resource call for the um, uh, music on hold and all that. And in the real-time monitoring tool also, there are new threads available in there where you can watch on a per hunt basis how many calls are in queue, what's the current longest queue time. Um, so um, there's you know, uh, it, stuff for that. So it's so a real-time monitoring tool gives you real-time statistics. The um, call detail records include this information. So if you're using CAR or third-party reporting utility for, you know, doing analysis on your call detail records, it's all in there. And there's tracing available as well. So absolutely, absolutely. Perfect. Okay, we have one more quick question. Oh, okay. What about RTMT? Uh, I, I just talked about RTMT, real-time monitoring tool. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, there's there's uh, threads available and whatnot in RTMT, and hopefully, if if I didn't answer that question, hopefully that person will follow up. But I think I hopefully I addressed it. Perfect. Anything else? Nope, that's it. Okay, alrighty. Um, so there you go. Native call queue again. Real simple to set up, which I just think is awesome. Next item up: deterministic codec selection. Prior to Call Manager nine. When I wanted to set up a code negotiation between two locations using locations-based CAC, the only real capability I could do is to exclude high bandwidth codecs by specifying the maximum codec um, uh, bandwidth utilization for a location-to-location -location call. So, but there, there's no way to you know, prefer G711A law over U law other than a global setting. Um, if I wanted to prefer G711 U law over G722, for instance, if I, you know, for, for whatever reason, maybe recording capabilities, there was no way to do that. If two phones uh, could negotiate G722, they would. And again, that is um, uh, changeable as a global setting, but sometimes you want to do it and sometimes you don't. So, starting with Call Manager 9, as far as the default codec preference lists, it's exactly the same as earlier versions, but it does allow you, the administrator, to create custom codec selection lists with the codecs in the order that you want and apply those on a per location to location basis. So you get your own list. Um, and it's, you know, it's codec negotiation. So the type of negotiation is irrelevant. If it's a skinny to skinny, skinny to SIP, SIP to SIP, SIP to MGCP, doesn't matter what the signaling protocol is. 
Again, this is akin to a codec, you know, voice class codec in a router. So um, codec list is part of your location and region setting and uh, therefore applied via the device pool. So it is going to be global, you know, really for a specific uh, phone, which uh, region it's in. But, you know, other than that, you, you know, you can do the inter-region settings all you want to. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to go into my regions. And first of all, I want to look at the preference lists themselves. There are two lists that are pre-built into Call Manager, factory default low loss, factory default velocity. Now, one thing I want to make clear, um, don't get confused between um, low loss and lossy codecs. That's not what this is talking about. A low loss codec being something like G711, a lossy codec being something like G723, as far as losing information. In this context, what they're talking about with regards to lossy versus low loss is, what is the nature of the underlying environment? Do you have a network where low loss is expected, like a LAN or a private WAN? Or do you have an infrastructure where lossy is a potential you know, possibility, like, you know, if I'm sending calls over the internet. So um, in the factory default lossy, um, uh, the ILBC is preferable because it recovers more from packet loss. That's really the upshot. That's really actually the only difference in the two anyway. So let's take a look at the factory default low loss. One of the things I thought that was cool about Call Manager 9 is there was no place where you could actually see this list. I mean, this is the same list they've been using forever and a day. We just didn't know what it was. So this is why you can see G722 is preferred over my G711. U law is preferred before a law. Oh, you know what? And I lied. It's not ILBC. It's um, ISAC. That's preferred. That's uh, higher up on the list if you've got the, the lossy. So there you go. This is the list. You know, you can see your G729 below your G711. Selected if you have uh, an inter-region setting where you're limiting amount of bandwidth. So let's create a new one. I'm going to copy this one that we have here, to factory default low loss, and I'm going to give it a new name. I'm going to call it Marin's factory default low loss. Save. Oh, sorry. Of course, no punctuation allowed. Now I get to specify what I want. And let's suppose, so I have U-Law here. I've got A-Law there. Um, I would like to prefer a law over U law. You know, I'm, I'm in you know Great Britain or whatever, or I have a specific location that's across the pond, and I'd like to make sure that I prefer a law over U law. If I set up a call between my two systems right now, answer mute, and if I do my little question mark, I can see that I've got G711 U law. So let's end the call and go back in here, and I'm going to prefer a law over u law, just because this is a simple example. You obviously get to choose you know, your list in the order you would like to have it. So um, I'm going to go into my uh, regions. I have a headquarters region and a branch region. Uh, Joe is in headquarters, and Jane is in branch. So let me open up headquarters here. And I'm going to specify that between headquarters and branch, currently factory default low loss. Instead, I'm going to say between headquarters and branch, I'd like to use the Marin factory low loss. I get the ability, even though I have my custom codec selection list, of limiting, you know, again, which codecs are used. If I limited it to G7, you know, 8K, I'd still get G729 even though I had reordered the G7, the 64K ones, the G711s, because it, that would be too much bandwidth for this setting. But I'm going to leave it at 64K. Let me go ahead and save here. And I need to reset my two regions. Restart. I'll reset my two phones. Or not. Okay. Uh, let me read all. Again, let me mute real quick. And I can see that I'm now using G711 A law. And again, really simple to implement. Your biggest challenge is going to be deciding, you know, which codecs you want to prefer. But you know, the, you know, if you have a recording server, anything going to the recording server, you know, you can make U law as G711 U law as opposed to G722. 
or if you have a third-party voicemail server that only allows G711, you can specify that. Or G, you know, anything going to this site, even though it's a land region, I want to make G729, you get to pick, which I just think is totally awesome. So very nice little feature there. Let me end the call. So that's uh, uh, deterministic codec selection. And Jamie, any questions? Um, no, I think we're all good. Not with that one? Okay. Nope. Moving right along. The next one we have, enhanced locations based CAC. Again, I find this very, very exciting. This to me is really, really cool. So prior to call manager nine, I could specify location A, I could specify location B, and I could say how much bandwidth is available into and out of A and into and out of B. The problem came if I had leaf sites. So let's suppose I have a headquarters in Chicago and I have a branch in Miami. Okay, fine. But outside of Chicago, I have a smaller sales site. Their link to the corporate intern intranet is via Chicago. And in Miami, let's suppose I've got a location in, oh, I don't know, Fort Lauderdale. And same thing, they, they get their access to the corporate network via Miami. If somebody in um, uh, the outside you know, in Chicago calls Fort Lauderdale, I have my, and let's just call it, oh, I don't know, Milwaukee. It's, you know, it's still a pretty big city, but let's say Milwaukee calls Fort, Fort Lauderdale. Call manager would deduct the bandwidth from Fort Lauderdale. Call manager would deduct the bandwidth from Milwaukee, not taking into account that that call had to flow through the link between Milwaukee to Chicago and then Chicago to Miami. I'm using bandwidth on the link between Chicago and Miami, but there was no way for call manager to take that into account. What you can do with call manager nine is not only specify all of your locations, and the amount of bandwidth into and out of that location. But you can also specify to what other locations this location has a link. So I can tell call manager, I have my Milwaukee location. It has a link to Chicago, and that is the only link it has. So any calls going into and out of Milwaukee must pass through Chicago. And I can do the same thing through Fort Lauderdale. Or maybe Fort Lauderdale does have another link through a different city. You know, who knows? But I get to map the actual topology. I can tell call manager what locations I have and how they are interconnected. If a, when a call is made, call manager will then determine how a call must flow to get from point A to point B and deduct bandwidth from all of the locations um, that, that would that be in that flow which is great. So you get the actual bandwidth. And there's some tools available to allow you to see, um, you know, G, hey, call manager, tell me what the path would be if I went from Milwaukee to Fort Lauderdale. Or, and it would show me the um, effective path, the bottleneck, like what bandwidth bottleneck does it have, um, how much the actual bandwidth in use right now, and I will show you those tools. It's, it's, it's pretty nifty. Um, let me talk about that first, and then we will talk. We will continue on with the other kind of interesting pieces of this. So let me go into call manager again. Um, oh, and let me change this back to um, system default. Not that it really matters because I'm still using. Oops, I'm still using. Uh, I'm still using um, the 60 you know, G711. But let's go into locations. And I have locations. I've got my HQ location and I've got my branch location. Hub none is going to be where my servers reside. If you have an infrastructure where you have servers like in two different data centers, you can specify locations for each of them. So if a call must pass through call manager, uh, using a media termination point or whatever, uh, you know, it, it can handle that. Um, Phantom is a leftover from previous versions. Shadow is used for intercluster SIP trunks, and remember that factoid because we will be coming back to that later in this conversation. So I have a location in headquarters, and I can see that my headquarters location 
has a link to hub none. Now notice it's not saying anything about a link to branch because it doesn't have one. Any calls that go between headquarters and branch are going to have to pass at least through hub none. Now we'll have to see how hub none is going to get to branch. But um, uh, you know, in, in, you know, for starters, this is how this call flows. I have also specified when I created this link that there was enough bandwidth for 240k between uh, HQ and HubNone. Now let me go in and, and take a, uh, show you how this is set up. So how much bandwidth is available for audio? How much bandwidth is available for standard video calls? Now we're just talking about, you know, I set up, um, you know, Jabber to Jabber and I do a video call. I have um, a you know 9900 series uh, phone with the, the, the camera in it and I'm doing a video call. This is that kind of standard video. How much of bandwidth do I have available for that kind of call? The third item, how much bandwidth do I have for the immersive video? This is for the Cisco full telepresence system. If I set up um, the telepresence system with the telepresence you know um, uh, location servers and all that, to interact with that, and that's that's a whole other ball game. But um, it allows it to specify, you know, to, to um, uh, delineate between the two different kinds. But this is where I set that up. This is where I set that up. If I wanted to set up a new link, I would add a new link. I would say maybe I do have a location to be our link between headquarters and branch, and you know, give it its bandwidth and all that. Now I'm not going to set that up because that would sort of defeat our um, our our uh, demo here. But here we go. So I have a, a link between headquarters and hub none. If I go back and open branch, I can see that I also have a link between branch and hub none. Call manager now knows that a call between headquarters and branch must flow through this other location here. And I can see that if I go into call manager serviceability, there are tools available specifically for this intercluster locations-based CAC, locations, topology. This will show me a list of all of my links, uh, all my locations and all of the links between them. Right? And I can download this and you know keep a documented copy in my records. Um, also another tool, effective path. Hey, call manager. If I'm going to place a call between headquarters and branch, please show me what the actual path is going to be. Headquarters to branch. It shows me that I can get there. I don't have an, an orphaned location somewhere. I can see that the least amount of bandwidth available on the path is 240K. And notice it says configured and available. I can also down here see the actual path. So this is going through one other location, but if we're going through two or three or four other locations, it would show me the entire path uh, for this call. So let's see it in action. Let me set up a call between Joe and Jane. And again, Joe is in headquarters, Jane is in branch. And answer, and again, put these guys on mute. And if I go in here and I do my little find again, Notice it immediately shows me not just what the configured bandwidth is, but what is currently available based on current call activity. So if you get a call at your help desk saying, hey, um, I can't make this call, or it sounds weird or something like that, um, you can see if there's available. Um, uh, and there you go. And so again, just very, very exciting. I like the fact that they finally did this. Now, getting back to this, this last guy here, intercluster enhanced locations CAC. What I'm going to set up on this cluster here, or what I would set up on this cluster here, is a locations bandwidth manager group. Let me take a look at that. Um, this allows me to tell this call manager which one of my servers in my cluster is going to be managing bandwidth for this cluster. So if I have eight call processing nodes, I may have another server in there somewhere that's actually doing the bandwidth calculations. Because every single call, once I turn this on, every single call must pass through the logic and be monitored by your location's bandwidth manager servers within your cluster. 
And again, if you have you know, a split cluster in two data centers, you would want to have at least one management server in each um, location. But they can be part of the same group and be sharing information, but failovers for each other as well. So I do that in this cluster, manage bandwidth in this cluster. I do the exact same thing in another cluster. And then using locations bandwidth manager hub groups, I can tell the two clusters about each other. As long as I have a SIP-based inter-cluster trunk between the two clusters, both in that shadow location, remember I said we talked about that shadow location, and I can specify for the shadow how much bandwidth is available through the shadow. So how much bandwidth is available between the clusters. If I have a U.S. cluster and a Europe cluster, for instance, and I have a single massive trunk between the U.S. and wherever I terminate in Europe, maybe England or something like that, I can say how much bandwidth is available over that trunk. And then the two clusters can share locations information. If I make a call from Chicago, it has to pass over my internal network, through the trunk that goes between the two clusters, over to my London location, the other end of the trunk, and then might be maybe going to Berlin. And I can do end-to-end -end intercluster locations-based call admission control because I get the two clusters to talk to each other, which is totally awesome. I think that's great. If you have more than one cluster, this is really, really neat. I know of one organization. They have the biggest deployment I have ever seen, big insurance company. They have, and I kid you not, 36 clusters, 400,000 handsets. And the way they um, determine to which cluster a specific phone is going to go, it's based on the phone number. So it is possible for me to be sitting down the hall from you, you call me to go to lunch, for instance, but your phone and my phone are on different clusters. That is entirely possible. Now, if I'm doing intercluster locations based CAC, that's great. You know, call manager can uh, manage the bandwidth between the, you know, the two phones for the call, but Really, really, that's a LAN call, isn't it? That's a local call. That doesn't go over any WAN length. It's not going out. It's going inside my LAN. So one of the things that I can do with this system is if I set up a location here in this, lo this cluster called capital H, capital Q, and I set up that same location name exactly in your cluster, and I turn on intercluster locations based CAC. Call manager, um, when it, my call manager talks to the call manager in the other cluster, they'll say, ooh, you have an HQ location, I have an HQ location. That must be the same location. And so the two clusters will determine that since they are in the same location, that it is the same location and it is a LAN call and will not take up bandwidth at either location because it's the same location. Again, I'm just, you know, smart people at Cisco doing this. If you have things like device mobility enabled, what location you're in is part of the information that gets changed on a device when it moves from one, one uh, a device mobility location to another one. So device mobility. And so, you know, if you take your phone, which is in a different cluster, and you actually go to another location somewhere and you're using device mobility, your phone will learn that it's in a different location and call manager will you know, appropriately manage the bandwidth. So very, very cool stuff. I'm just very, very excited about this. Um, and that's locations-based CAF. Any other details I haven't talked about yet? Let's see. Oh, no, that's the next item. So locations-based CAC, intercluster enhanced locations CAC. Features and services guide will help you figure out how to set this up. It's not hard. It's not all that much harder than standard locations CAC. Jamie, question. Yes. yes, we did have a few. Um, oh. how, how does it determine between video versus telepresence devices? It has to do with, um, if you have the full on telepresence systems, there are uh, registration systems inside your organization for uh, telepresence calls. Um, it's managed by a separate telepresence um, um, 
um, application which manages the calls and all that. So I, that's essentially how it does that. If, if my call manager cluster knows it's talking to one of these telepresence systems, it will, um, it, you know, it, it, it will deduct from that bandwidth, which is substantial. If you know anything about those telepresence rooms, they take up a boatload of bandwidth. So that's why they have it separate from standard video calls. Now that said, you can still have a standard video call at 384 joining one of these telepresence systems. So if you do want to limit the bandwidth, you can do that so it's not taking up a boatload of bandwidth on your backbone. Um, hopefully that answers the question. Uh, anything else? Yeah, one more. Um, is RTMT updated showing the real-time bandwidth? Yes. Yes, the um, intercluster locations CAC, in addition to the tools and the serviceability menu, again, added threads telling you information about current bandwidth consumption on individual links um, and into and out of individual locations. So yes, there are threads for that. Yep. Awesome. That yep. covers it. Good. Yep. Okay. Alrighty. The last few items are relatively short. Um, that I, you know, I want to do the biggies first in case people had to go, you know, other places. Not that you wouldn't want to stay till the end, of course. Um, next item, URI registration and dialing. URI, Uniform Resource Identifier. The eventual these systems, everything's going to be running SIP, I think, at least anyway, eventually. And SIP is based in, um, you know, developed by the IETF, based in World Wide Web, sorts of things. So it uses DNS and email type naming conventions, at least eventually. Right now, the way SIP mostly works is it'll be like, oh, you know, 2001 at you know, 10.4.1.1, and you know that 10.4.1.1 server would know where 2001 is, and I'd be making a phone call. But eventually, what we would like to do with SIP is to be able to say, hey, I'd like to, you know, uh, send a phone call to John Doe at Cisco.com. And John Doe at Cisco.com would be resolved in a DNS server as, oh, you know, this would be a, a special record for a phone call. It would pipe it over to call manager. And the trick with call manager is call manager has to be able to interpret this. What I'm going to need to do is associate an end user account with a phone number, a URI with a phone number. It makes it an alias for your directory number. So call manager can receive the request and send it to the correct um, a phone and all that. Um, so here we go. Let's, let's test it out. I have a, an x -Lite soft phone over here, and I, I picked this just because it's one of the phones that I know of, and it's freeware, um, that can do URI dialing. So, so let's try it out. So I can dial the hard way, like uh, Joe at 10.4.1.1, right, I'm dialing, and I place, and you can see that that indeed is ringing. Oh, I still have that other call. Let me get back to here. Resume. End call. There we go. There we go. Mute. And mute. Hopefully it'll die. Oh. So I've made a URI call. Um, where does call manager know about this? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Joe's directory number on Joe's phone. That happens to be this one right here. Go to his directory number. And here we go. Me, the administrator, I manually add these URIs. And I have specified that Joe at 10.4.1.1 is an alias for this directory number. So when call manager receives a request for this, it knows where to go. And if I have uh, DNS involved or, you know, as long as my Xlight software would know how to resolve pod4.com, you know, I can do it that way too. So let's try that out. So. Uh, Joe at pod4.com. And I guess that's ringing here. So there you go. URI dialing. Not as big a deal today because today we're not doing the more sophisticated SIP stuff, but it is coming. And Call Manager is definitely ahead of the game in. Um, Hold resume, end call. Thank you. Uh, call manager is definitely in front of the game doing this, which, again, just exciting stuff, exciting stuff, very forward thinking. 
Um, this style of dialing is already available in certain Tenbird systems. Again, providing that Tenbird system has access to a DNS server, um, OCS link. Um, if I'm doing a, you know, a dynamic DNS and I register my soft client with my username to DDNS and I have these systems, I can dial and it will find me. What's the best way to get a hold of me? Is it my link client? Is it my desk phone? What? So cool stuff. Cool stuff coming. Um, that's what I have for that. Jamie, questions about URI dialing? Nope. We're all good. Next item. And again, oh. Oh, yeah, actually, this is actually very exciting. Cisco's biggest competitor right now is Microsoft. That's the company that has Cisco running a little scared. And the reason is that Microsoft is making substantial headway into voice over IP arenas. Their link client, because people know Microsoft, and that's Microsoft integrated, want to do the link client instead of the um, uh, the Cisco clients, at least especially the Cupsy client, because that was a little clumsy. So Cisco has come out, of course, with Jabber. Now, starting with Call Manager 9, they are giving away present seats. If you have a phone um, and a user account and you are licensed for that, you get presence, period, end of story. You don't have to really have anything else. There's no capabilities assignments anymore. You, you know, again, if you're, you have an account, you're good to go. The other thing Cisco did is try to make the um, administration of presence easier. Now, I still need a presence server. Still got to have presence ser servers stood up and, and integrated with Call Manager, but then all of the uh, administration of profiles and um, system uh, integration um, pieces, like you know, how do I get to a CUC server? Where's the mail store? All that stuff, all done in Call Manager. So simplified licensing common client across multiple platforms so people have a consistent user experience. Jabber is, you know, they got Jabber for Mac, Jabber for um, Windows, various Windows platforms, um, your, your, your iPhone, your Android. So, you know, common user experience with a common client, um, all back ending into Call Manager and, you know, presence for everyone, Jabber for everyone. That's what they're talking about. So let's take a look at that real quick. I, it, this is Mostly other than the theory of it, it's a matter of, you know, are you doing it or not? But under user management, I can go into user settings. I'm sorry. User settings, right. And UC services. This is where I go in and determine uh, what services are available via um, presence. So service profiles, this allows me to set up various profiles right, pod for profile. This for unified messaging specifically, but it allows me to say, you know, where's my uh, voicemail server, et cetera, et cetera. Where's my mail store? Uh, if I have a, a WebEx or a meeting place, where's that? So if you have done um, uh, you know, administration of presence in prior versions, this will all make sense. You know, you, you know you, you have to set up all of these things. Um, directory profile for LDAP, et cetera, et cetera. And then, under user management, you see services. This is where I get to set up the individual services. So where is my CTI server? Where is my voicemail server? So you set up the services. You put the services together into a profile. And then when I create end user accounts, one of the things I'm going to tell them, let me go get Joe here, is which profile they have access to. Pod for, pod for profile. So when you're creating a user account, you specify the profile and poof, they have everything they need to be presence integrated. So you throw up their Jabber client and they are done. And we have uh, Jabber clients here on these systems. And, it, you know, again, fully integrated. Let me make a call between my XLite soft phone and Jane. Right. Answer and unmute. And I can see that Jane is on a call. But like before, you know, I can send Jane an IM. Um, Heidi Ho neighbor. Right. And even though Jane's on the phone, Jane still gets this. So, you know, um, all of the standard presence uh, related client capabilities, all available in Jabber. But now you don't have to have extra licensing for it. And it makes it much easier. Client, I think, is a lot easier to administer too than the old Cupsy client. Um, 
Oh, oh, oh and there's one other thing I wanted to um, talk to you about too. So in addition, on the Jabber client, let me end this call since I'm thinking about it. On the Jabber client, see these uh, icons over here on the left? Here I'm seeing my directory of users, my list of missed calls in case you're fine. I can see if I have new emails, there's my email stuff. But then these other ones here, meetings, I can see uh, Twitter feeds, I can see, I uh, don't have these, I have them configured for Jane, I thought I had them configured. I think they got taken out because they were somebody's private stuff and it was uh, uh, political and so we took it out. But these other icons, it's a globe icon, worldwide web. You can set up links on the side here in your Jabber client to get to wherever it is you want to. Okay, Twitter feed, right? I can click here to see my Twitter feed. I can click here, here's my Facebook. Um, you can do a corporate intern, intranet, you know, and again, in my Jabber client, I click one thing and go there. Cisco's goal is and this has always been true, is one interface, all my different kinds of communications. And this is an example of that. I can have my Jabber client and not only get my phone and my voicemail and connect to my meetings, but I can also access the corporate intranet, access um, the you know um, social media that's used by my company or whatever. Um, the biggest problem with that in Jabber is setting up those links um, it is not an easy thing to do. You sort of have to be an LDAP uh, or an XML programmer to get that all set up properly. There are some utilities available to aid you with that, um, but it's, it's, it's trickier than it actually sounds. Um, but anyway, but Jabber. So Cisco has highly enhanced Jabber, again, as a direct reaction to Microsoft Link because Microsoft Link is becoming so popular. Um, cool stuff. Um, I think that's all I have for that. Uh, Jamie, do we have any questions on the Jabber client or I am in presence? Um, we had one question, but I think you actually already answered it. Um, do we still need a present server? For now, yes. Um, what I am told, and I have not confirmed this yet because uh, 10 is not yet out. With Call Manager 9, they have the administration integrated with, for presence, integrated with Call Manager. What I am told is that in Call Manager 10, the actual um, presence application is going to be directly integrated on the Call Manager server. So what I understand is on 10, no, you will not need a new presence server, but that's just what I, I have uh, read, and so your mileage may vary. I, hopefully that's true, because that's one fewer server that I need in my system. They're giving it away anyway, so why not, right? So hopefully so. Um, Anything else, Jamie? Nope, nope, that covered it, awesome. Oh, okay, last two quick items. Um, right, okay, UC services. Um, three items, Cisco Extend and Connect. Now, I'm unable today to demonstrate this, but let me talk about it. Here's the deal. You have integrated Call Manager with a third-party PBX. Maybe you're in the process of migrating Maybe you have part of your organization that, for whatever reason, wants or needs to stay on the traditional PBX. Cisco Call Manager has a lot of really, really cool features. You know, aside from just simple things like hold and conference, um, you know, some of the other features that you can use if you have a, a Cisco client, it's, you know, intercom, it's quite extensive. But I can't use that stuff if I've got a third-party phone, at least not through Call Manager or with call manager based phones. So here's what Extend and Connect does. Extend and Connect allows me to create a new type of device it's called a CTI remote device. That CTI remote device is a phone. I'll go, you know, device, phone, add new, what kind, CTI remote device. I will issue that device a phone number and that is the phone number that users will use to contact you on the third party PBS. The CTI remote device is going to have a mobile connect um, configuration with it. When somebody calls the number that is at the CTI remote device, it will dial out and ring your phone, wherever that is. Might be a third party PBX phone, could be your home phone. What if you are a um, contact center agent, you're using your home phone for business, 
But as soon as I answer a call on my home phone, I don't get all the fancy features. You know, get hold and conference and transfer and all that that I do if I am using a Cisco client at my house. But I'm using a home phone today. By using Mobile Connect and dialing out to that device, the phone call is managed, or at least you can manage it, via a Jabber client. Because I can have my Jabber client connected to the CTI remote device. I can use the Jabber interface to hold and conference and transfer and you know look stuff up and, and whatnot. The audio connection goes to that whatever that end device is, third-party PDX device, home phone. The um, user, however, so I'm at my house, I have my PC up, my Jabber client up, my Jabber client talks to the CTI remote device. A user calls the CTI remote device that number, it calls my home phone, but now I get to manage the call. So I get all the fancy features, um, which makes it, again, it, it, it's just a very exciting. I wish I could, um, I wish I could uh, demonstrate this today, but I really can't. But this includes, you know, they're showing you a Unity connection icon on here. A Unity connection, if somebody calls the main number and they want to get a hold of you, but you're on that third party PDX, for instance. Um, I, you know, I, you know, if you know your party's extension, please uh, dial it now. So they dial your number. It now hits the CTI remote device, which is integrated with the Cisco Jabber. That Cisco Jabber dials out to your third-party PBX phone. And again, I get to manage that call through the Jabber client, but the audio goes to wherever it is I need to go, which is just really, really awesome. Same thing, if I dial in, uh, to mobile voice access using that third party device and I have call manager dial out for me using MVA, again, that Jabber client gets invoked, the CTI remote device gets invoked and I can manage that call after I've dialed out through the Jabber client. So cool, cool stuff. Um, any questions about that, Jamie? Yes. Um, can this be used along with a Cisco phone? No, the intention is that it's going to be a third-party phone. The CTI remote device, you wouldn't need if you had a Cisco phone. If you have a Cisco phone, you already have access to Jabber and uh, all, the, you know, the, all the features and all that. You already have ex, you know, access to Mobile Connect and all that. So you, you wouldn't need it if you had a Cisco phone. That's really the upshot of that. So no, not really. Perfect. In fact, I think you can't, remember, if I'm not mistaken with Mobile Connect, the remote device that you're ringing cannot be a Cisco phone. So it would not work in this situation anyway. Sorry. Okay. All right. Does it allow more than one extension on a phone? Yes. Yes. So your CTI remote device can have more than one extension. So either of the numbers, you know, so you have a home phone or your, um, your office number and your contact center number, both can be managed by the Cisco Jabber client. Yes, ma'am. Sir, other. Sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. And one last question. Is there any additional licensing required? Nope. Other than um, needing to have a phone license, if you're using cool licensing and you already have a user license because they have a user account, which they would need to have in order to have a, a, a Jabber client, then they're covered. They have to have a license in call manager, like a cool license, but other than that, no additional licensing is necessary for all these other features or specifically for Extend and Connect, so no. All right. Anything else? Nope. That, that's all there is right now. Okay. Last couple of quick items. Oh, so all of these features. This is all the features you can use with Extended Connect. So you can set yourself to do not disturb. You can play your DTMF, your Jabber client, call forward all, redirecting. Neat stuff. Neat stuff. Okay. Um, two quickies. New user pages. And I'm also going to talk about the um, pause and speed dial because you can sort of do those together. User web pages. Um, when I log into an end user web interface, first of all, again, different look to it. And the first thing I see is a list of the devices that I have access to. It used to be in the old system, I had to select it from a list. Now I get to see all of them on the main page and just click on the one I want to manage. Um, and in that, um, if I don't have advanced features configured, it doesn't show me advanced feature options. As soon as advanced features are configured, like Mobile Connect, for instance, then it shows up on my web page. No other sort of, um, uh, you know, configuration needed as far as administration. I don't have to check a box to give them the advanced page. So it, it's really nice. It's really nice. 
uh, to one of these. I'm going to go ahead and extend this. Let me log in. Uh, oh, that's unfortunate. TTPS colon whack whack 10.4.1.1 UCM user. It's a different one, different uh, URL, although the old one will redirect to the new one. I'm going to log in with Joe. <laughs> And here we go. Over on the left, I get to see all of the devices that I have access to. And for this one, you know, what sorts of features do I want to do? For this one, which sorts of features do I want to do? So this is my Jabber client. This is my Cupsy client, or my um, I think communicator client. And you know, it, it makes it really easy for users to use it. The old one was kind of clumsy. If you didn't already know where to go, it was hard to navigate to places. So it, it, it's you know just a redesign now. Other smaller feature, the pause in speed dial. So if you are an organization that uses forced authorization codes, or lots of lawyers offices used uh, client matter codes, so they can uh, bill calls to various clients just by running a report. If you are creating a speed dial going to a pager, uh, you know, or a transfer system, you know, this is this is you know being able to put those pauses in so that things can play out is is awesome. Um, so what I'm going to set up the speed dial. This is just to make it easy. I'm going to set up a speed dial. I'm going to set up a speed dial. The phone number is going to be my and this is just because this is what I have available. It's going to be 2500, which is my voicemail pilot. I'm going to put in a couple of commas. Each comma is two seconds. This is going to allow Unity Connection to say, please enter your PIN. And then I'm going to put in my PIN. Now, this is just an example. I wouldn't necessarily want to do this in real life because, you know, I don't want people getting to my voicemail by pressing a button, but you get the idea. Voicemail. I click Save. It shows up. And now, if I go back to my IP communicator phone here, I can see that I've got this voicemail button. So let me try giving it a call. Oh, I didn't put it down. Oh, there we are. There you go. So it allowed me to log in, in this case, because that's what I asked it to do, by being able to put those pauses in the speed dial so that you can add additional digits as necessary. Just a nice little handy feature. I, I think that, you know, those couple of things are just, it's just nice. Um, when you're doing a pause and speed dial, how many milliseconds do you want between that digit presses? This is a new service parameter for the call manager service. And this becomes important if you have, especially old, like older pager systems that you're trying to access. If you dial too fast, it doesn't understand. So you, that is a configurable item. Um, I think that's all I have for that. Uh, and that is actually brings us to the end of our presentation. I uh, hope you enjoyed that. Um, please feel free to email us if you have questions or anything else that uh, you know if we can uh, help you find information. Um, but again, features and services guide. That is sort of your first stop uh, shopping for all of this stuff. It's all explained how to do in there. Um, and before we go, Jamie, do we have any additional final questions? Yeah, we had a few come up. Um, is the Jabber client included in 9.0? The, you, know, you still have to download the, and install the client, but as far as licensing is concerned, yes, it is. Jabber for everyone is what Cisco calls it. So, yes. Okay, very cool. Um, what are the differences between 9.0 and 9.1, 9.2? Um, the, the, so, I have, again, this is sort of one of those things I've just sort of heard. I, I have not experienced it, but I've run across this on the Cisco support forums and all that. There's some stability issues with 9.0. Um, if you are planning to do an upgrade, I would encourage you to do 9.1 or 9.2. Um, other things, you know, here's a strange thing. So, um, so do you see how on my uh, uh, IP communicator here, I am currently logged into a hunt group. Weird item in call manager 9.0 that they fixed in 9.1. Um, I, if I am hunted to for a hunt call and I do not answer, it automatically logs me out. So you pretty much have to deploy the HLog soft key so people can hunt, you know, log themselves back into the hunt group, which I just think is nuts, but they fixed that in 
Now, the big thing in 9.1 is that um, those third-party service servers, so you may have heard of Synapse or IP Celerate, uh, Informacast has now been integrated with Call Manager 9.1. You still have to, again, stand up an Informacast server, but it comes as part of the suite um, and you can integrate it with, you still have to get licensing for it, but um, it, it's more tightly integrated with Call Manager than it has been. And that, that's starting with Call Manager 9, which I find, again, very exciting. So, you know, area paging, some of the other services, again, that Call Manager just doesn't do. If you are part of a school or a hospital and you use those apps, you know, schools do use, um, you know, attendance and meal of the day and daily announcements and all that via the phones. Um, either apps for that, all supported by stuff like Informacast. And now that, and, you know, is part of the suite of uh, servers that uh, associate with your cluster, which I, again, 9.1, very exciting. I think it's actually really cool. Um, that's what I know about that. And again, the big thing in 10, um, from what I hear, is the integration of presence with call manager, but I, I'll believe that when I actually see it. Uh, Cisco has a seminar in July for rolling, you know, rolling out the, you know, what's coming next in 10. Um, I don't know if anybody has an opportunity to go to that, but it should be very exciting. Uh, anything else, Jamie? No, I, um, oh. I think you answered all the questions. I think we're good to go. So cool. yeah, thank you so much, Marm, for taking the time to do this. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we will be sending out the recorded version. But if you have any additional questions, feel free to reach out to marketing at sunsetlearning.com and we'll get you taken care of. Thanks so. for coming. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you.